Welcome to the 214th episode of the Jamie Delaney Plant-Based Wellness Podcast. My name is Jamie Delaney, and I'm your host. I'm a plant-based cardiologist and endurance athlete living in southwest Florida. Welcome, and thank you for listening. It is hot here in Florida. Humidity is out of the roof. Um, Had a little bit of rain, but for the most part, it's going to be hot, hot, hot. Um, Training for the Chattanooga Ironman, so swim, bike, run is in full force. Uh, one to uh, not quite up to two weight training sessions a week at this point, um, but we're working on it. Bikes up to 60 to 70 miles, long runs are around, oh, I don't know, 13 to 15, and uh, I'm trying to do a little speed work, a little pickups, some hill work, because the Chattanooga run is pretty hilly. So all's going well, feel good, so that's good. We did. Ha- we actually get, did get caught in the rain last two uh, rides. We had some Florida thunderstorms that we've had to hide out under some um, interstate underpasses, but uh, for the most part, uh, that was a welcomed relief and a little cooling. So no rain forecast for this weekend in southwest Florida, so it'll be a hot ride and a hot run tomorrow, but that's all good because the run in Chattanooga is usually a hot one, so got to get ready. I hope you tuned into the episode last week. I, I know I really enjoyed it and learned a lot. I am trying to incorporate Patrick McGowan's um, breathing into my running and biking. I think that it's really helping. It's actually helping in the swimming too. My swimming, I'm uh, trying to breathe every fourth breath and do some, we do some pulls where we do three, five breathing. So that is helpful to you know, really watch my breath, make sure I'm breathing from my diaphragm. And also on the long run, I'm, uh, it, it's helping me keep my heart rate down. It's helping me to have to um, not really need as much fuel. So I did 14 miles with just a little bit of grape juice after four or five miles um, and actually felt really good. I uh, didn't have any of that muscle fatigue that I have in the past. And I, I really do attribute it to being able to li- deliver more oxygen to my tissues. And so the... the, the um, um, basic mechanism is that if you, you know, if your oxygen uh, saturation is good, which it is when you're running and anybody that's not in the hospital, the oxygen saturation is greater than 90%, but you need carbon dioxide to be able to unload that oxygen into your tissues. Otherwise, it's like having money in the bank, but no groceries in the cabinet. So by becoming more tolerant of CO2, not over breathing, then you're able to deliver oxygen, uh, more oxygen to your tissues, better metabolism, um, and it seems to be working, so I'm, I'm, I'm working on that during my swim, bike, and runs. Uh, I'm also doing some hyperventilation with breath holds. The hyperventilation aspect of it is to actually um, increase um, diaphragm strength and coordination as well as intercostal rib strength and coordination, and then the breath holds help to increase the CO2 tolerance. And then when if you hold your breath, you'll notice that you have some contractions up under your diaphragm, and it actually causes some splenic contractions, can actually increase your hemoglobin a little bit because you keep a lot of red blood cells in your spleen, so you kind of squeeze those out. So um, actually all good, and I, I, um, I think that that's something that I'm definitely adding into my, to my practice for my endurance events. As far as my backyard garden, it is um, coming to an end. There's a few tomatoes left and a few peppers left. And my herbs are okay, but for the most part, it's really hot down here. Um, and the plants just can't tolerate the, the heat and humidity. I think the humidity really bothers them more than anything else. They just, uh, it's trouble, trouble getting blooms and, and holding on. But mango season is in full force, and we're starting to harvest mangoes, and they're wonderful. Um, you know, I've said it a million times on the podcast, but we have a, uh, over 40 varieties of mangoes in Florida. And, you know, some of them have fiber, some of them don't have fiber, but they're all kinds of flavors, just like you would have grape flavors. And uh, just just really wonderful. We have uh, one that we harvest that tastes, um, I would say, some, some combinations. It's actually called a peach mango, but it, it tastes more like a pina colada to me, uh, a little coconutty. Um, and then there's one that has a little bit of essence of orange. Um, so it's just, just really, really good. So it's a fun time of the year to be in Florida. Of course, watermelons down here are in season. And I really enjoy rehydrating after my runs and rides with watermelon. One of my favorites evening smoothie is a frozen banana, watermelon, and some ice to make that kind of a slushy slash smoothie. 
Um, very, very hydrating and um, just really good for recovery. Mango is good in fiber. I'm, I'm sorry, watermelons are, you know, have a good bit of fiber, a lot of water, um, a lot of vitamin C, uh, antioxidants. So it's just really, really a good uh, recovery, recovery fruit. So I encourage you to check fruit out as far as, you know, your recovery from, from rinds and workout. Everybody gets all bent out of shape of about wanting uh, protein. Your body doesn't know what to do with protein powder. Um, so you're better off hydrating, getting your antioxidant, antioxidants in, and then eating some real food. So that's my tip for training at this point. You know, um, we had a really good level three class today uh, in, in for our nutrition class. I teach three nutrition classes a week. On Thursday evening, we have a introduction to plant-based nutrition and then on Monday and Friday, we have, you know, what we call um, intermediate. And then Friday is definitely my advanced class. The only difference between the level two, the Monday class and the Friday class is that more people are um, better acquainted with cooking on a regular basis. Um, for the most part, they are completely plant-based on Friday. Monday, people are, there are some people in the class that are still transitioning a little bit. Um, still have a little bit of problems with cra cravings. The, you know, you probably understand one foot in one camp and one foot in the other uh, camp, you know, trying to figure out how to eat, um, health, trying to figure out how to eat healthy at the same time, trying to figure out how to eat the junk food that their friends eat. So it's a little more of a struggle um, yet in the level two class, but they're, they're, they're coming along. And, and you know, when it comes to um, transitioning to a plant-based diet, you know, people usually start out by hearing that that's what they should do. They may read a book. Um, they may watch a movie. They may hear a podcast. They may attend an immersion conference or another plant-based conference. And it really gets them motivated and they want to do it. Um, but it's really not enough for most people to be able to continue to be plant-based and to um, really optimize their diet on their own. And, you know, I think there's a higher incidence of people on again, off again, on again, off again. Um, and that's where our nutrition classes kind of come in as far as, you know, supporting people and um, letting them or teaching them how to cook meals that are, are very, um, they look good, they taste good. Um, they're something to look forward to. And so we did something interesting today um, along those lines because I think that when you're cooking plant-based or you want to be plant-based, it's a time and opportunity to be creative. And, you know, we just came out with our cookbook, um, Plant-Based Wellness Cookbook, uh, The Doctor, The Dietitian, and The Diva. And everything is, the sales are going really good. Uh, if you haven't got your copy, please hop on over to Amazon and, and uh, grab a copy for us and give us a five-star review. We would love that. And the recipes in the cookbook are recipes that we've done in class, recipes that are my family recipes. Um, they're safe for everybody, whether they have rheumatoid arthritis or heart disease or diabetes. So, um, and whether you have kids, so, so they're, they're recipes that everybody likes. It's family cooking um, that, that was created by myself my daughter, Addie Delaney Minerich, and my mom, Alfreda. But, you know, we've all been cooking um, for a long time. And, you know, my grandmother and my mother, they, you know, they, they more or less looked at what they had in the refrigerator and they made a meal. And never really, other than if my mother saw something in a magazine on occasion, you know, my grandmother never looked at a cookbook. They just created the food that they had uh, in front of works with what they had. Or perhaps if they tasted something out, um, especially maybe my mom, my grandmother never went out, but um, they would, you know, recreate something. So that's, that's really what we were up to today was to try to let people create. So we had a um, whiteboard with our ingredients that we had available for them to use. So we had a grains available, brown rice, quinoa, and frika. Frika, if you don't know, is a... Uh, wheat, a sun-dried wheat um, that's very hearty. And then we had uh, can cannellini beans, garbanzo beans, and black beans to choose from. We had greens available, collards from my garden, bok choy and spinach. 
Um, vegetables, carrots, red and green and yellow peppers, Thai chili peppers, zucchini, uh, and tomatoes. Um, and then we had, you know, any spice that they might need. We had lemons, tamari, peanut butter powder, miso, sriracha, horseradish, vinegar, garlic, and artichoke hearts. So, and then I gave them a plate, um, yeah. and Addie, our dietitian, uh, gave a lecture um, at our conference. She she talks about you know moving your plate towards what you need, but you know how to how to prepare a plate that's nutritious. Um, typically, you know when people eat the standard American diet, growing up you'd have a meat, a starch, and a vegetable. That was you know the plate, and of course, if people know about the FDA plate that you know it's kind of like that more more vegetables and fruit, but. You know, our plant-based nutrition plate is we want people to get the greens. We want the four to five cups of the Swiss chard, cauliflower, cabbage, kale, mustard greens, collard greens. So we want four to five cups of those, and we want a lot of other vegetables, as many as people want, and then a grain or a, or a potato. And then, of course, um, you know, people can – and a, and a bean um, of some sort usually in, into that mix as well. So those were the choices that we, we had on hand for them to pick. And uh, and so they were to write down their menu, and then we read them, and we decided which one. Um, I guess I made the ultimate decision, but I had feedback from the crowd as far as which recipe we we might make, and it was it was very interesting. You know, people early on um, they put the the vegetables in the categories, but they, you know, some people weren't quite sure what they wanted to do. Um, you know, one good thing when you have a bunch of vegetables to, is always to make a stir fry. So, you know, you can make a stir fry and you can change the sauces. So you can make it more of a Thai or an Indian or, uh, you know, you can, you know, change your ethnicity of the, that stir fry. But I, I wanted people to get away from just tossing everything into one pot if they could and, and give a little thought to it. Because just like, you know, stripes and polka dots, uh, there are some vegetables that go together better than others. And you want to have, an, you wanna have, we want a variety of vegetables in a, in a variety of color, but we also want to be able to taste the individual vegetables. And so sometimes when we, you know, it's great to make a soup or a stir fry, but sometimes the, the tastes start to blend together a little bit and you don't really get to appreciate all the different varieties of, of food that you might have. So we wanted to, you know, see how see who could. We wanted to pick a creative uh, recipe that was a little bit um, outside the box, and what we had, and then we and we kind of then redid it a little bit. So one person suggested we make a Spanish rice, which would have been with rice and um, black beans and uh, different kinds of peppers and onions and tomatoes, all stir fried with some paprika and chili powder. So we decided to change that grain to quinoa just to, you know, give it, give it a little bit of a different twist to see how that might go with, with those beans. And so we did that. Uh, we added a Thai chili powder and a little uh, sriracha, a little bit more cayenne for a little bit more heat. And we served it over spinach. So raw spinach uh, was the base and then served, served that. And it was really, really good. And then the other recipe that we decided on was to do a patty um, that was made um, originally with quinoa and um, carrots and onions and peppers. Well, since we'd already used quinoa and some people hadn't tried frica, we decided to try it with the frica. So we made uh, the frica and then we took the carrots and onions and garlic and put that in a food processor and blended that all down and then mixed the frica and the together. We added a little bit of oat flour to, to bind it a little bit um, better just because we were in uh, a little bit of a hurry for an hour and a half, two hour class. And then the sauce was a garbanzo bean, lemon juice, garlic, onion, um, um, you know, watered down to, to make a, a sauce with some sriracha in that. And it was really, really good. It, it tasted a little bit like a falafel, um, you know, with, uh, you know, a little bit more uh, along the lines of the frica in it. So we called it the uh, Falafelus freak, freaking a patty. You know that was our nickname for the class. So I guess next cookbook you might see that recipe in there. But it turned out really good. And we actually put those under the broiler so we could get it done quick, and they were really really tasty. And you know it was great fun because everybody had input, and people that weren't quite as creative um, got to you know experience 
doing something outside of the the norm, you know, that's outside of the norm of a stir fry or outside of the norm of a soup. Um, and, and we went over the, the thought process of, you know, why we would actually choose those grains or why we wanted a grain and a green and the vegetables. Um, they were all hearty. Um, you could have taken those patties and put them inside a collard um, or served them on top of greens. You know, that was the way um, that, you know, we had talked about serving them, but it would be a good collard wrap uh, in the future with that sauce on top. So there's lots of different ways to repurpose it. Um, we actually had some of this, the uh, Spanish quinoa uh, left over, and I stuck it on a baked potato uh, later. So, you know, that was I repurposed that um, and then had some greens and, and corn for, for my dinner. So if you make some of those things, you can, you know, repurpose them and have, you know, a whole other meal. But, you're, you know, again, you're getting the beans and the grains, and none of the sauces were heavy. None of them were calorie-dense. Um, we had some lime juice in the, um, the Spanish quinoa as well, so, and lemon juice in the other one. So we had, you know, lots of vitamin C, lots of fiber, you know, lots of protein, lots, you know, not like you're not going to get it. We had our grains. So it was a great way to, to, to think outside the box, and I was, you know, really, really pleased, and everybody had a good time. I think you have to get your hands dirty and, and experiment a little bit to, to really learn. Some things are going to turn out good, some things not so good, um, some things you would change. It's really important to taste things as you go. You know, something just was, you know, kind of missing. Um, if you have a, an ingredient that you don't like, you substitute another one. Maybe that's, you know, not really the ingredient um, that you want using fresh herbs if you have those available you know it always always helps out and kind of getting to know the herbs that that, that kind of go together uh that you can you know you, you kind of have a i guess a theme in mind as opposed to just dumping every spice in the drawer and every vegetable in the refrigerator into one pot and stirring it up and you know having this um uh stew of sorts uh it's nice to see things presented on the other hand, a student brought me a picture of she went out to dinner and it wasn't a plant-based restaurant, but they brought her this meal that was the base end of a butternut squash. I assumed it had been roasted. Um, it was on a bed of quinoa and some quinoa, or I'm sorry, on a bed of uh, brown rice and there was some rice around it and they stuck two carrots that were whole in top of it, just like stuck it in like birthday candles with the tips on and the carrots, I think, were cooked a little bit, but obviously weren't cooked in enough that they would break. And there were some grapes in there, perhaps, and some spinach. And quite frankly, to me, it looked like um, an afterthought. And I don't care. They're plant-based. They are carrot eaters, you know, rabbits. Uh, doesn't matter. Um, to me, it was not creative at all. Um, you know, butternut squash in the, in the grain, I would have liked another vegetable. Greens would have been, you know, greens and beans and the butternut, butternut squash would have been a, a great idea maybe to put the greens inside the butternut squash. Um, fillet it open, you know, so you could see the roasted marks, you know, maybe do um, some pomegranate seeds or something. There's so many other things you could have done as opposed to it looked like, you know, somebody when you buy a, you get a coconut at a fair and they stick a straw in the coconut and people walking around with the coconuts. That's what the the uh, bok cho the uh, butternut squash look like to me, and you know that's not showing much creativity to me um, coming from a chef, um, and and it's an afterthought. And and to me, if people aren't willing to put a little bit of effort or thought into it, then yeah, you know I probably wouldn't um, uh, really patronize you know that area again. I've been thinking a little bit this week about the philosophy of plant based nutrition. Um, you know those of us that understand the health benefits of eating plant-based and are okay with the idea of eating for our health as opposed to eating for just pure pleasure, um, eating and not eating just vegan for the animals, but vegan for people. Um, I think it's, you know, we, we become that way and then we'd like others to be that way. And the reality of it is, you know, 96% of the world, you know, eats a standard American diet. They may dabble in some plant foods, almond milk or a veggie burger or beyond beef burger. But that's pretty much, um, you know, it's a 
a, a small percentage of people that actually eat plant-based that eat plant-based for their health. And certainly we'd like that number to grow and we'd like more people and people get excited when the stock of, you know, these uh, burger companies start to go up and yay, it's catching on. And um, I, I, I kind of look at it as um, just another, you know, food on the market that's not really going to help anybody's health. Um, somewhat of a fad. I'm glad that animals aren't being killed. Um, I think it's probably better for the planet. Um, but the reality of it is it's, it's not going to help the human plate that we have such a uh, high incidence of diabetes and over, uh, overweight uh, in our populations that, you know, just to substitute a vegetable plant-based burger for a regular burger is not really going to fix anything. And, you know, like I said, we'd all like to have more people to be plant-based. And, and how do you go about it? That's the kicker. You know, um, when I first started doing plant-based nutrition classes, I had a traditional medical practice, traditional cardiology practice. So people would be referred to me for treatment of their arrhythmia or their chest pain or the coronary artery disease. And most of them had diabetes and high blood pressure and high cholesterol. And, you know, I felt compelled as a part of my recommendations to say, you know, that we can do a heart catheterization or we can do a stress test, a heart catheterization, you can get a stent or a bypass, but there is another way around this and you can actually reverse these lifestyle diseases by what you eat. And, you know, if you took this nutrition course, it would tell you about it. And, you know, we'd love to, you know, to share and to help you make this transition. We can get you off your medications. And, you know, I really make this sale to them um, and plead with them to, to do it this way, knowing that there was much less risk of them dying if they would adopt a plant-based diet. Um, and I would get, you know, we, we started out in the nutrition class, there would be about 10% uh, of people that I drug there, so to speak, and convinced to go because they, they really don't want to be sick. Nobody does. And then there would be like 10% that were really interested and want to learn. And then there'd be somebody, you know, the middle people would be just kind of floundering a little bit. And it's, they're learning for the first time. And, and some of those, you know, went on to become plant-based, but still really struggled having both feet in both, in both camps. And, you know, how to get people to, to come over and stay and want to do it this way. And, you know, we talk about people being a lighthouse and, you know, who should we ultimately market to, um, you know, obviously, if I were to go to McDonald's and stand out there, you know, in the parking lot with a sign saying, hey, you know, plant-based is the way to go. You know, we can reverse your heart disease if you'll trade that burger and fries in for some quinoa and uh, tomatoes and, and zucchini. Um, I'm probably not going to get very many people that are going to, um, uh, you know, they, they, they want the McDonald's and, and they're going to come around. Even if, even if it's for their health, they, they're really not going to not going to believe it. And then there's another segment of the population um, who uh, perhaps are much more affluent that they want to live, um, but they, they want everything for with convenience. So they want to be able to go out and dine out, you know, four or five, maybe more times a week. Uh, they certainly don't want to cook their own food or expect anybody else in their household to cook their own food. Uh, they want it to be simple. They want it to taste good. They don't want much change. Um, they haven't made the connection between nutrition and food, but it seems too complicated. So, um, you know, we'll take our chances with the medical community. You know, hopefully there'll be stem cells or some great uh, procedure that's non-invasive that can keep them going. Um, and they can pretty much, you know, do what they want and continue on the same, same path. And, and so the question is, how do we, you know, what, what group's more likely to, to make the change and, and how, do, how do we attract them? And I think that, you know, a lot of times um, maybe the cell's too much that, you know, it's, you know, people, you've heard people say, well, if it tastes good, don't eat it. Um, and, and that's certainly not the truth because everything that, you know, I'd like to sink in our cookbook tastes very good. And what we make tastes very good. It's colorful ones, you know, um, I don't, I don't think that's really the issue and, you know, fight back against that. But I, I think that, um, the concept of whether this is hard or not, or whether or not, um, it's worthwhile to make your own food, um, uh, needs to be approached a different way. The reality of it is making your own food, like we did today in class, is very creative. Um, you think about the ingredients and the nutrients involved, and it's life-giving food. Um, 
it causes, you know, it, it allows you to feel better and do better and, and, and everything around it is healthy, you know, even if it's just taking time to be in your own house and prepare your own food and be with your own family and have control over the ingredients, shop with your family, know, uh, you know, that you're buying um, things that don't, you know, have a lot of, you know, oil and processed, you know, and all their chemicals in them. Um, it, it shows that, you know, we need to convey to people that it really shows that you care. My grandmother cooked every meal. Um, she didn't go out. She made her own bread. She cooked everything that came from the garden. Um, and that was her way of showing her love to the family. And it was very important for her to make a cook. And she was respected because of what a good cook that she was. And I think we've lost that somewhere along the line. We've taken, taken cooking and made it into a chore, uh, made it into something that if you're affluent that you don't need to no longer do. So um, go through and get takeout or then you're in too big of a hurry uh, to, to take time to do this. And that it doesn't matter what you eat. Um, it wouldn't be out there if it wasn't adequate, and certainly it doesn't have any short-term effects on what you do or what you eat. Um, so you can eat a sausage egg McMuffin and energy drinks all day long and be okay. Um, and so I think that that's where we need to actually change the focus to, you know, this is, is, is much more about than about the food um, as a whole, but uh, uh, but the whole process of how we're our relationship with what we prepare and the time we take to prepare it and how you present it, um, you know, it, it if something really looks good on the plate, then people are more likely to want to try it. When if if you have ever taken a covered dish to a uh, you know a picnic that wasn't plant based but it looked really good, people were apt to to want to try it. On the other hand, if something you know it looks pretty nasty, then you know most people won't. Um, you know unless it's some kind of goopy, greasy, whatever, and and so <laughs> that they're that they're used to eating. But you know I I, I think that. You know, taking that little extra time to care about what you're actually presenting. And, you know, it's what I, I love about our members in our practice, that they're, they're really enjoying cooking food and seeing what they're creating. Um, and, and they're, you know, and, and they, um, a couple people, several people actually have got together and made recipes from our cookbook and put them online on our private Facebook page. And, you know, shared them and, you know, really liked them. Some people have taken some of the recipes out. But it's, it's a way of showcasing that they care. Um, they care about their health and they care about others for whom they make it. They're enjoying spending time together. And I, and I think that's all a really, uh, really positive thing that comes out of eating this way as opposed to um, getting up and driving through a window and scarfing something down on the way to work and drinking a power a protein drink at your desk and, you know, going and getting more takeout while you watch TV or uh, look at a computer screen in the evening and, and then go to bed and start the, the whole process again. So I think that, you know, we, we need to step away from um, how we just how we look at how we perceive cooking and, and and start to change that with other people that this is a great thing and perhaps maybe showcasing your own cooking for other people i know in our class early on people are very afraid to cook for people that aren't plant-based and when they do they want to make something that's very very complicated and they typically want to make something that resembles something non-plant-based so I had a woman in the office today, and she said, I've tried eggplant bacon, and I've tried coconut bacon, and it just really doesn't taste much like bacon. I really didn't like bacon that much before, but I, you know, I wanted to try to make it. And then she said, I, you know, I, I tried to make a recipe with a vital wheat gluten, and it came out nasty, and so it didn't taste anything like, you know, meat. And I want to make for our potluck, I, she said, I wanted to make this, um, plant-based brisket type dish that had jackfruit and vital wheat gluten in it but she was afraid because it had a lot of steps and recipes and a lot of uh, different ingredients and wonder if it didn't turn out and didn't taste you know like a brisket and 
then she talked about, you know, she's still looking to try to perfect a plant-based cheesecake. And she's just, you know, she was just wanted something, um, you know, plant-based that was like, you know, the old, you know, like a pie crust. And it's like, well, the problem is, and, and I think we've all been there and gone through that, or maybe you are, is this notion that we can make something that's plant-based that's much healthier than its alternative in, you know, a meat-based version. Um, you know, let's take cheesecake, for example. You know, so the cream cheese and uh, sugar and, you know, so, and then the Coke, the um, typically what a graham cracker crust, you know. So it's really high fat. Uh, there's eggs in the, you know, regular cheesecake and, you know, high cholesterol. So if you're trying to make a plant-based cholesterol, you've got to make, it's a fatty dessert by design. So you can't make a non-fat dessert as a cheesecake. It just doesn't happen. So people typically, you know, will do coconut milk and cashews and things like that, maybe avocado to make this filling. And, you know, so it becomes so rich with saturated fat that you really haven't changed things that much. And it might be pretty close. Uh, it might not be, but it's still not a healthy alternative. It's just another recreation and I think that turns some people off that aren't plant-based, that you're trying to convince, see, we can do this. You know, we're not giving up anything. I think the opposite should happen. It's like, hey, yeah, we, we actually gave this stuff up because it is bad for you. You know, bacon causes cancer. You know, red meat increases your risk of colon cancer. Chicken increases your risk of lymphoma. Eggs cause, you know, they have cholesterol and saturated fat. Um, they 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 contribute to cardiovascular disease and diabetes. We, we don't need to recreate these things. They, they weren't healthy in the first place. So we are moving away from this into healthy foods um, that have a whole new taste and flavor with herbs and spices that aren't in those categories. Because if you, if you always want the bacon even if it's a eggplant bacon and you always want the the cash you know you need that you're looking for that uh decadent dessert that's full of fat that's not moving you into a health and when it doesn't happen then you feel as though um you're disappointed that you've haven't you've had to give up so many things and it's not you're not giving up anything you're getting health you're getting better food, you're getting fiber, you're getting longevity, and what you can do with that um, is, is amazing. The lack of joint pain, the lack of autoimmune diseases, the lack of diabetes, the lack of obesity, um, the lack of heart disease, being able to breathe better, to being able to look better, um, that's all something that people overlook. You know, I, I observe uh, the class you know, we, we tease a little bit about it, but, you know, if I go to the grocery store, I, I look, you know, I'm, I'm looking at what's in people's carts. I'm looking at them as far as, you know, what they're, what they're putting in the cart. Do they look healthy? Do they have swollen legs? You know, are they in heart failure? Um, do they have obvious pain in their back? They, they're leaning over their cart. Um, are they breathing heavily because, you know, they have asthma or, um, you know, some other sort of lung, lung condition that they're, they're really out of shape, you know, what, and, and then you put, you see the cart and, and what's in that. And, and you, you know, you put those two together as opposed to seeing somebody that, you know, is plant-based that, that has their color is good. They have a, a spring in their step. Um, they have energy to do things at evening, in the evening after work. They have energy to play with their children. They're not sick. They're not taking medication. They're not sitting in a doctor's office. Um, those are all things that, that, you know, that, that we need to connect the dots to. There's no amount of money that guarantees good health, um, especially if you're going to eat standard American diet. So you can have lobster and show the cheesy desserts and the cheesecakes and the steaks and the, you know, the big ribs and all these kind of things um, as, a, as, you know, and choose that for a status symbol. But I, I see it as a impending doom symbol. I, I see it as hiding, uh, you know, hiding misery, that the only thing you have left is this 10 minutes of eating this terrible food 
uh, and the rest of your life is is pretty much miserable because you can't be healthy. If you look at people, um, you know, from 40 to 55 or 60, you see a 10, 20, 30 pound weight gain in people. They, you might not even recognize people when you see them and you haven't seen them for a while. And it's because no one can tolerate the standard American diet. No one continues to put these chemicals in their body and accumulate all this metabolic waste without it catching up to them. And, uh, you know, it, it comes down to this, like, you know, this, this is really how it is. And um, you can declare it. I'm not going to pay with my dollar for substandard food. I'm not going to pay for the, you know, you can't disrespect me with a poor meal and, and expect me to stand there and eat it. I'm going to hold my ground. I don't want any part of it. Um, and I'm, you know, anxious to help anybody learn the process of cooking plant-based and the whys behind why it's, you know, why eating green vegetables, you know, you can produce nitric oxide that dilate your arteries and reduce your chest pain and decrease the plaque in your arteries so your blood pressure ultimately goes down. How you can learn to breathe better so that you can oxygenate your tissues. The idea is to be able to live well until you don't, not to live in excess and to um, be subject to this mass marketing of eat this um, to drown your sorrows, take this pill to drown your pain, um, and food has nothing to do with it. So if you know somebody out there that, um, you know, is not eating very well and they don't look very healthy, invite them over to dinner and, and cook an, a very creative plant-based meal. It won't kill them. Um, might just make them feel better. They might just say that this looks great, but at least you're going to get a good plant-based dinner and you gave them a you know you gave them some antioxidants you might have added a couple hours onto the life by doing it but you have to have the the courage to stand up and say look I am this is a creative process I am so happy to be able to be creating these wonderful plant-based meals that are so rich in color and are presented so beautifully on a plate and you know you might be surprised um, who we get to join us so uh, I hope you and uh, you know you, you take take that to heart. I hope you uh, try to be a little creative this weekend. You know the weekends are times to um, uh, try something new, try a new recipe, try and you know pick a new grain to try, uh, pick a new vegetable, do new combination, and, and you know and look at things. Um, if you see something at the grocery store, or you've been out to dinner and you've liked something um, that you've had, then then make it at home. And, and take out the, maybe the, the, the stuff that wasn't as good. You know, there's nothing that needs to have oil in it. So you can take that right out up front. Um, you know, substitute hot peppers for sauces so that you can um, actually get some heat without the extra oil and things. And get the junk food out of your diet and see how, see how well you feel. And, and push your body. Um, the other thing that I saw this week was... Um, a strength coach online said that running and jogging was not good for you. That it was a, it wasn't that it wasn't so good for you, but it was a, a worthless exercise, and that you'd be better off to do intermittent intermittent sprints or intervals. Well, the idea that people, you know, are going to go out and um, you know they haven't done any of these things and put themselves in um, significant stress when they try to sprint for the first time in fifteen or twenty years is is absolutely ridiculous. Um, you know, that's a really good way to get hurt. Yes, a lot of people get hurt running every year. Typically, they uh, do too much too quick, um, it's usually, but it's nothing permanent that, you know, people don't get permanently damaged from running. It, we were meant to move. Um, you know, when Dr. Kukazella was on here, you know, there's something magical about having both feet in the air. Um, you're flying for a short little period of time. It's invigorating. You have endorphins that are released. Um, it, you're getting outside, you're getting fresh air, you're increasing your oxygen consumption. And again, you know, by training to do this correctly, breathing through your nose, um, you know, learning to get a good gait and, and focusing on these things, not doing too much too soon, you add years onto your life. It's, it's a proven, it's a proven fact. 
And if, if something is extremely painful every time you do it, then you're probably not going to do it on a regular basis or on a consistent basis. So I think there's really nothing better than getting outside no matter what the temperature is. Um, certainly get out in the morning earlier if you haven't been out and acclimated to to the to the temperature but you know getting fresh air there's just nothing that beats it getting vitamin d um that's where we need to get our vitamin d is outside i think you're in a stuffy gym um for all of your workouts the microbes in there um and the you know the antiseptics that are used and the possible allergies that are available i don't think that's necessarily in your best interest certainly to go once in a while to be your weight training or if you know if it's raining or something but i don't think that you know, focusing all your training inside is the way to go. So, so get out and, uh, uh, you know, move your body and run. Start out slow. Just do walk, walk, run, and, uh, you know, get yourself uh, so that you can, you know, run steady and enjoy it. Or at least take a brisk walk outside. I, I, but I don't think there's anything with running at any age uh, as long as you start out, um Appropriately, the first thing that happens is people's tendons. There's different when you're pounding from running as opposed to walking. It's a much different set of muscles, so they have to get acclimated. Your feet have to get acclimated. I saw somebody yesterday that you know had worn hard shoes all their life. Their feet were completely flat, and so if you put that person out on the streets running, they're going to get plantar fasciitis. Their their calf muscles are are going to be tight. So they have to work into it, you know, uh, they have to strengthen their feet and the tendons, uh, you know, and around your ankles have to be strengthened. So that has to, ha that has to occur gradually and, and everybody has to pay their dues for that. Um, but it's not something that, oh, you know, I got plantar fasciitis and I can't run or, oh, my knees hurt, I can't run. Well, your knees hurt for a reason um, that the muscles are weak around your knees and that's the, that's, you know, where the tendons hook in. So we need to uh, focus on strengthening those. We need to focus on, on people's technique, on, on helping them to run correctly uh, and not do this jump from, you know, couch to marathon in, you know, six, six eight weeks. So enjoy the process and get, you get out and, um, and, and move your body. And, and uh, this is a good time of year to do some yard work. It's great cross-training. You know, carrying mulch, digging a few holes. So do a little garden, plant some herbs. Again, get the sunlight and enjoy yourself. So until next week, um, have a great week. Make something colorful and creative and share it with your non-plant-based friends and say, look here, this is great food. You should try it.